Well, I was a, an elected official in Vancouver for 18 years, elected to council in 1986. And at that time, there was tremendous demolition going on in the West End because there was a demand for housing in Vancouver's mm -hmm. small city, 44 square miles. Yeah. And here at uh, uh, Drake and Pacific Boulevard, uh, you see that it runs into the West End, and there was a tremendous amount of demolition going on in the middle uh, 80s, and council got very upset about it because they were pushing over small walk-up stucco buildings and putting big high-rise towers in were very expensive, disrupting a lot of seniors that were in modest rental accommodation living there for years. So suddenly, Expo was over, and there was this 210 acres, uh, and uh, the right thing to do was to sell it to one owner, and that's exactly what was done. Li Kai Sheng from Hong Kong bought it, very deep pockets, and uh, he's been for the past uh, 17 years building this out, and there's been about a billion and a half dollars spent on it. But what the uniqueness is here is that of the 210 acres, they're only building on 82 acres of this old expo site. The rest is parks, 18 acres of parks. We're right here by the David Lamb Park, uh, and um, we've got uh, all the public areas, the Round Dust Community Center, etc., etc. Extensive public Extensive amenities. Public amenities. It's a balanced, livable community, and that's the secret to it. Sure. And uh, there's now uh, the, the downtown population of Vancouver as a result of developments like this and uh, Coal Harbor Marathon. The downtown residential population from the mid-80s, which was just under 40,000, now, according to Larry Beasley at City Hall, it's 85,000 people living on this small downtown central core, three and a half square miles, and it's going to go to um, 120,000 people by 2020. So what was the need, what was the demographic need that's making it so interesting to live downtown here? Do you know what's, what's changing about the population of Vancouver that makes this well, so attractive now? Well, it was built um, to accommodate everybody. Therefore, you have tremendous diversity. We didn't expect, for example, that there would be that many children living in these condominiums. And as a result, uh, across the street, there's the Dorothy Lamb, and you can get a better picture of the Dorothy Lamb uh, Daycare Center. And right next to it, they're under construction here with a, a primary school. And they're probably going to have to build another one. And uh, as a result, this is very, very mixed housing. You can see here we're on the edge of a co-op building here, and we'll see a better picture from the front. But there's a co-op building right here where people are paying $325 a month rent. There's people in Sydney Manor here. This is a senior's private sector rental building. You have to be over 55 years old, and it's all rental, very modest rental. And you look the other way down Drake Street, and you will see the Concord, which was the deluxe building that just opened a year ago, and those units in there were selling then at an atrocious price of $500 a foot, which is double what a lot of people paid for a condominium down here three and four years ago. Uh, now that is very reasonable. They are building condominiums now down here that are up at six and seven hundred dollars a foot and Concord is planning to have one designed by Arthur Erickson on their presentation site uh, here on this area there'll be a thousand dollars a foot so what you've got is you've got at the top of the Concord an apartment selling for four and a half million dollars across the street there's someone who is a single mother or a couple living with modest income in a co-op paying three hundred and twenty five dollars a month and uh, there's other people renting condominiums around here, anywhere from uh, 12, 14, 1500, 2000, 25. There's absolute incredible diversity, both in age, population, income, cultural difference. Uh, there's young children, and you can be born now in the downtown core of Vancouver and live for 90 or 100 years and have all your needs met. There isn't one need through your entire lifetime that can't be met living in the three and a half square mile downtown core of Vancouver. That's unique in the world. What do you think of the streetscape down here when um, in the, on a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon when people are out in the parks? I mean, does it, uh, do you have a sense of, uh, of what the community is, has become down here? Well, the community has become a solidified, uh, friendly, wonderfully balanced, livable, uh, socially, economically uh, diverse neighborhood, which is absolutely unique because you have no idea uh, the people that are that are paying four or five million dollars for a condominium, uh, you have no idea whether on the street what anybody's income is. You don't know whether they're on social assistance or they're on welfare or they're living in a co-op or they're renting or they're buying or what they are. And everybody just mixes with everybody. They go into Urban Fair or wander around Davie Street, go through the shops in Yale Town, and uh, it's totally accessible. Able-bodied, disabled people, 
age difference, income difference, cultural difference. I mean, name a need you have uh, and a person in society that can't feel comfortable in the Coal Harbor development and in also the Concord development. Both of them are the same on uh, Coal Harbor and Both over here at Falls Creek. Both sides are the same. Exactly. Yes, Amazing. So, well, looking forward, I mean, uh, has this met so, the need? So what happened? Time to move on? Well, I don't, it's, it's still, oh, look at the number of buildings that Terry Huey from Concord Pacific has built. He's going to put up another 14 buildings. It's unbelievable. And you can see what's going on in the center of the downtown core on Nelson at Richards and Nelson and uh, Seymour and Homer and Helmican. Big concrete towers going up and they're all selling our bakuki. But what we said in the West End back to the mid-80s was that it would only allow a 5% rate of change. So they couldn't get a lot of bulldozers in, no more than 5% rate of change, and then rezoned this for residential, sold to Mr. Li Kai Sheng of Hong Kong, and then council took a potential 15 million square feet of office space, zoned land, commercial and office, and rezoned that to residential. And that was brilliant because that was done in the late 80s, early 90s, and look what the market's doing now, 10, 12 years later, building in the center of the downtown core all the residential units that are going up with independent uh, developers. They're not part of Marathon and Coal Harbor are part of Concord Pacific, and they're pre-selling them. So, take a step back from the downtown and start uh, and look at the city from a uh, uh, from maybe the surrounding the sort of uh, the the lower density, the single-family neighborhoods. What is the impact of this kind of intense development downtown going to have on the development of the single-family neighborhoods that really surround? The well, it's the city? preserved them. It's preserved them because. There's this pent-up demand for housing accommodation, and there's a huge trend to be to living in a condominium and not live in a freestanding house. And if we hadn't provided all these market units in this area in a different form of living, the pressure would have been in the RS1 single-family residential areas to go in with bulldozers and start demolishing the stable neighborhoods. And the pressure for redevelopment in those areas has been alleviated because of what we've done in the downtown core. So uh, nobody could predict that it was going to be so successful, but it was just kind of a lot of genius work with a lot of very capable people. People like Larry Beasley and all his staff up at City Hall who came up with all these ideas and worked closely with council. And um, we were lucky with the market, but also there was some visioning going on 15 years ago in the city because we were trying to look ahead 10, 15, 20, and 30 years. And uh, it's worked out perfectly. Now we'll go across the street here for a second because I talked to you about Okay. So we're looking at we're looking at uh, you know four to five million dollar units that are some people would buy two of them there. And and right kitty corner from that there's a co op where people are living for three hundred and twenty five dollars a month. There's no gated communities. You're not gated or segregated or stigmatized by your uh, income level, your economic uh, level. Uh, everybody at all economic levels lives here peacefully and happily and shares the sidewalks, and there's nothing gated. You can't say, oh, the high-income earners live there, and the low-income earners live there, and you don't warehouse people, and you don't have units like filling the whole Woodward store full of uh, social housing. That's stigmatizing people. Do people have questions about uh, the security and safety down in this neighborhood? Well, I don't know. I've lived here for four years. I live right, uh, I'll show you where I live in that 12-story uh, building we're just walking towards right now. And uh, I walk around at night and drive around at night, and I never think about it. I guess there might be some people turn. I'm sure there's some break-ins, but uh, this place is uh, lively and busy and full of people and full of activity. And uh, there's uh, no reason not to feel perfectly safe inside or outside, wherever uh, you might happen to live, on this whole site or anywhere in the downtown core, as far as that goes. Is it quiet at night? Absolutely. People say, I must be guessing. It's okay. We don't notice any noise problems. Anywhere you live, you'll hear a siren at night, even in a residential area. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's, you know, the, the city's cracked down on motorcycles and uh, noisy exhaust uh, cars that take the tailpipes off and uh, motorcycles and make a lot of noise. But I mean, you just look at this. See, there's the Roundhouse, Roundhouse Cooperative, 1267. So how do, you, how do you get around in this neighborhood? Do you drive? No, I walk mostly. I know a lot of people that have sold uh, one of their cars and the couple's down to one car. 
Like I'm going, yesterday I had to go to um, Park Place at the corner of Bensamere and uh, Bride to a, a meeting at 3 o'clock. I walk. I'm meeting someone for lunch today down Hastings Street near Bride and I'm going to walk. And uh, I got my umbrella, my raincoat, and I can uh, move around. My wife and I go to General Motors Place, or over to Tinseltown for a movie, or General Motors Place for a hockey game, or up to the Orpheum or Queen Elizabeth Theatre, and we walk. Have Never you, think about you, driving. Have you sold your car yet? No, I'm a car nut. I collect cars, so I'm a, I'm, I have to. I'm a guy that has to have cars. <laughs> well, hopefully and, they and, don't uh, close out the parking spots. And, and, and there you are with. Well, we've reduced the parking spots. It was well, that's, uh, that's to, right. reducing it all the time. It's coming down. It was two and a half, two point seven uh, per unit, two point five. It's now below two, apparently. Now, does that accommodate the demographic that basically they don't they don't feel they want cars? They want to be able to walk. Oh, you don't need two cars. A couple uh, can get along with one car instead of two. Yeah. Now we're looking down 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 Davy Street, and you can see another thing in the downtown is street end views. So you go down Davy Street, and you head towards English Bay, you have a view right down to the water. You go the other end and you're heading south uh, or south um, east, I guess it is, on Davy Street, coming into this area, and you'll see that this street end view here is open. That's another city policy. We've done that all around the city. You go along Georgia Street and look north from um, Richards, uh, Seymour, Granville, Howe, Hornby, Bright, and look north and you will see the water in the mountains. So you have locked street end views. And the other thing here is building separations. Now, this is quite interesting down here, why this is so so livable. Just look at what they've done with the buildings behind the second row of buildings. You can see the second row of buildings, but there's space. This is what Larry Beasley talks about, uh, spacing of buildings, having view corridors, and separation of buildings so you don't get two flat buildings like that butting up against each other. Everybody looks into their neighbor. They're all spaced and separated. And, uh, they get a certain amount of privacy, even though it's a city of glass. That's right. Oh, absolutely. And you don't even think about it. I mean, I live in this building here. It's 12 stories. And um, we're right in the middle of that. Uh, and you look across and you see all the buildings. part of the charm. You don't even think about the fact you need more privacy or less privacy. It uh, doesn't bother anybody. I don't hear anybody complain about it. Now, is this neighborhood over-designed? Is there too much uh, design consistency between the buildings? No, I don't think so. I think there's a, uh, is that always just a matter of personal uh, oh, I think so. And look, choice? and the decision of taking the um, water's edge, 75 feet of the water's edge, and making public ground, that was a revolutionary thing. Everybody thought, well, you own the land, you own the, the, the high water mark. Uh, no, you don't. You go back 75 feet. The public, uh, this as a result, there's 28 kilometers of seawalks around Vancouver, including all the way from BC Place and going over to... Uh, uh, around Stanley Park and coming all around here to uh, Falls Creek. You see the building, tall building to the right, and about uh, right behind it, there's a, a six, eight-story building. You can see two sides of it. That's a co-op. That's uh, got a daycare in it, and it's a safe and secure center, mostly women, single women with young children, and uh, it's a, a totally complete social housing unit as I was pointing out the seniors rental and the co-op and so on and you've got just absolutely every age and every income level living here in peace and happiness and harmony and it works. Can, can you tell us about social housing in Vancouver? Um, Vancouver's made a tremendous commitment to that in the yeah. past years perhaps more so than... Oh, I think we lead North America in it. There's uh, approximately 22,000 subsidized social non-market housing units in Vancouver. That's one in 12 in the entire housing stock I think Jill Davis and Natalia, the numbers are uh, that's very close to those numbers. Uh, I don't think there's another city in North America can say that. I go to big city mayor's meetings across Canada and the other mayors, and I would say that we've got uh, 22 odd thousand subsidized social non-market housing units intermixed with uh, all other prices of housing, and it works socially and economically very, very well, and that means there's no stigma and uh, there's no gated communities and you can't identify that's a low-income earner neighborhood and that's a high-income neighborhood. What are some of the characteristics of Vancouver that allow uh, us to make that commitment to social housing that maybe other cities that you know of haven't been able to? Well, I think to? it's because it's been a council policy to, to continue to do that and also if you have to remember that the city of Vancouver has the property endowment fund and the largest 
property owner in the city of Vancouver is the city of Vancouver. And look at the increased value of the land the city's got. The city has been buying, for example, the southeast area of False Creek near Science World where the um, Athletes Village is going to go. The city has owned some of that land for 40, 50 years. They got it during the Depression in the 30s through tax sales. And they just were continually looking and buying and uh, keeping a very high land base for future highway bridge developments always been a policy and the ones that aren't used for civic the land isn't used for civic purposes like fire halls or police stations or city hall is in the property endowment fund and that's market driven housing and the city's been able to bring to the table high valued property very low cost the city but put it into um, a facility where the senior governments traditionally have come and gone on social housing yes, and a yes. private sector would come in yes. and you get uh, an arrangement the city would lease that land so, and so they've cities? always been doing we've concentrated yes. Yes. on uh, on social housing right. through all different councils. Other big cities have neglected that, or, That's correct. or they Absolutely. don't have the money, or is it? Uh... It's been the, the the federal government was very big on socializing up into '93, yeah. and the province was a partnership. So you get the city with the land, yeah. and uh, you get a private uh, organization, society of some sort, nonprofit that would do the uh, the managing of it, and you get operating funds to senior levels of government and construction costs, and we were just doing that in huge numbers all through the. Um, 80s and 80s, yeah. uh, into the early 90s and then we went without the federal government now the federal government's come back into social housing they got a billion dollars set aside for ho homelessness and a billion dollars for social housing and the province are backing out a bit but the city's always been able to creatively find a way to keep providing subsidized non-market social housing units for people at the low income level so uh, w what has that done for the city to have these uh, these very uh, the social housing available to it I mean has it um has it allowed the city to, to diversify in a certain way, or what has that brought to the city in your view? Well, it's brought a city that, uh, city that works, and a city that's socially and economically viable, uh, and it's a city that uh, is rated as generally the number one city in the world because of that, because of its strong financial base, its commitment to all society, all income levels, all ages, and all abilities. We're the number one leader. You ask Tim Lewis or Sam Sullivan, they say we lead in Vancouver, lead North America on accessibility in cities. That's been a policy for 20 years in the city. And Marguerite Ford was the councillor at the time. And you just say that you're going to include everybody and be inclusive and let the private sector, private market do its thing under stringent rules and policies as laid down by uh, city council. So, uh, and everybody wins in the end, absolutely everybody. And that's been proven in Vancouver for a couple of decades and the groundwork's laid, so that will continue for the next couple of decades. Kitty corner from that co-op where people are paying $325 a month rent, some of them are, you'll see the Concord, which is across this, can we just cut and move? Yeah, yeah, just rather right than top. Watch your step. So you can get an edge of that. And then you swing over and you can see that curved building with the, see? That is the Concord. And that came on the market at $500 a square foot to purchase. And people were just horrified that it would be that high. And that now is turning out to be a bargain because they're coming on the market at six and $700 a foot for some of the big deluxe places that are large with high ceilings, uh, electric baseboard, uh, it's not like hot water baseboard hot water heating and high ceilings and all sorts of amenities. Have values gone up here the same as the rest of the city? Like are we up 20% this year in yes. 2003 yep. and yep. 25 Yeah, that's 40% in two or three years? Some of them, that's correct. Yeah, They've gone from a 600, a 2,000, generally, uh, as you can, as you say, the, 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 what they're building now, yep. the Peter Wallace building on yep. the Maple Leaf side, is small units yeah. uh, and uh, those are the ones where people are able to get in at uh, I, I think probably three or four hundred uh, four hundred dollars a foot and you've got the seven hundred feet that's two hundred eighty thousand dollars so what kind of people do you think that's going to accommodate in the city what sort of age group and demographic all age groups it's people that are retired become empty nesters single people that are in the job market and uh, the service sector market and restaurants and so on and young couples uh, just married and couples that live together and aren't married and <laughs> it's just a, because the numbers work if you get the modest down payment yeah. it's cheaper to rent than to own get in the equity market yeah.
Now this is the fear is that this there's, there's going to be an end to this because it's been doing this steadily for 15, 20 years, and I don't. There's going to be a time when the private sector traditionally oversaturates the market and overbuilds. So I think I would predict in a couple of years there might be a slight slump. If the interest rates go up and start getting 10% for that'll, prime, that'll then you're going to see a huge yeah. correction, yeah. and there'll be a huge opportunity for anybody who can yeah. that's yeah. been waiting yeah. to move in. Yeah. And the, okay. but the, the the somebody who bought a uh, a 2,000 square foot unit down here for $600,000, say in 1998 or 99, uh, would sell that unit now for 850 or $900,000. That's what's happened in four or five years. Extremely, uh, that's a great success for but anyone who bought there's it. There's always a correction on these. Yeah. Nothing ever keeps going forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there will be some correction, I predict, in the next, uh, somewhere in the next four and ten years. It's just the way life is. But in the meantime, it's a hell of a party, and we're providing lots of housing so that we've stabilized the traditional neighborhoods of Hastings East, of Caresdale, of the West End, uh, of South Granville Apartments. You don't see a lot of demolition and renewal, so they're stabilized. And uh, this development has taken the pressure off bulldozers going in the single-family residential areas that you know about uh, scattered around the city, in Marple or Hastings East or Sunrise or wherever it might happen to be.